here in Trader Kingdom has a plethora, a wealth, a mansion of information. So if you are new to Trader Kingdom, go ahead and look over all the webinars and part of the webinar today. So Ganesh Jasha, thank you all for taking time out. Goodness, it's been busy, hasn't it? In terms of the market volatility picking up, we're having all sort of new things. The Federal Reserve, we're having the crash just took place, the recovery's taking place, and oh my goodness, volatility's back here. So we'll go over a lot of things with that. I'll make this really an informal session. So as if you've had my style of presentation, it's interactive. So I don't want to just be talking here for 30 minutes or an hour and all that. So type in any questions, comments, observations uh, about your trading experiences, successes, failures, things I can discuss, all those sort of things as we progress. And as I always do, I overcommit information. So we have an hour and lots of slides and lots of information to go through. You'd think that trading intraday reversals would be a relatively simple process and simple presentation, but as you'll see, we'll get into lots and lots of nuances and examples, real world things, and hopefully I will see some of your examples too. So we'll go through those. But yeah, this is one of my favorite things to do in terms of trading and strategizing. It's planning those reversals. I'm not necessarily a reversal style trader. I'm more looking forward to doing trend continuity, but trends don't last forever. They reverse. So that's kind of brings us to this, which is the trading involves risk. If a trend day was a trend day always or a range day and the market always went up or always went down, hopefully not, but if it did, we'd be all in a great position, but it doesn't. Trend days that start off promising and exciting sometimes fail. They'll turn into what we'll call rounded reversals or V-spike reversals. There's two ways a market can reverse. Violently, a V-spike, just up then down, or like this one here with a divergence, going to the Dow theory stuff of distribution, divergence, rounded reversals, wedges, all these little patterns that take place that forecast in advance that a market's probably going to reverse. Those are the kind we prefer. Those are the kind that give us lots and lots of opportunities, warnings, and lots of ways to trade that and profit from it. V spikes, not so much. Anyway, so again, as Josh said, I've been doing this since 1999 and trading full time since 2007. Move my way through the fundamental world, which is the Warren Buffett style, picking a stock and holding it forever, looking at earnings, balance statements, all those kind of things. Found technical analysis, which is a lot better way to do that, a lot more fun and more risk, really ways to control risk and profit, all those sort of things. 2003 to present, been a technical analyst. Did my CMT in 2009, finished that two-year program, highly recommended. You learn everything up and down about technical analysis, things you want to learn and things you don't want to learn, <laughs> but things that definitely help you on your trading career. And moved not too long, oh, three years now, I guess not too long ago, but three years from Alabama, you might pick up my southern accent, to Los Angeles, which is a much sunnier, more fun place than <laughs> North Alabama, but happy to be here. And as Josh said, I wrote the complete trading course and also the life cycle of a stock move, also with Wiley. So let's jump ahead and see in what we're doing here. So all the core of the presentation, we're talking theory, we're talking research, we're talking concepts. Let's drill it down to this, three things, and only three things. It makes your job a lot easier, which is retracements. If you know my style, this is my bread and butter. I am a pro trend retracement style trader. That's what I love doing. The market doesn't always do that, so the market can reverse, and Elliott Wave plays into it, moving averages, volume, all these little focal points that we'll discuss today. We're focusing on reversals. Other trade setup is breakouts. You can model these, test them out. You probably have experience with these, but if, type in and then check box, make sure we're on the same page. What's your favorite? So it's kind of in your experience, one year, two year, 10 years, or whatever your trading experience is, just let me know which of these are your favorites. Retracements, reversals, breakouts. Some retracement, yeah, retrace. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, Gary says reversals. Interesting. Well, you're in the right spot here, Gary. <laughs> We're talking reversals. Uh, Scott says retracements. It's kind of jumping in here. Other retracements. Anybody like breakouts? Nobody said breakouts yet. Any breakout traders? Lauren says three. Break. All right, cool. <laughs> Love this. Well, with the interaction, so Lauren says three for breakouts. So good to go. We have a lot of people on all sides of the equation here. So we'll focus on this. For today's session, there's lots of other archives. And JJ says trend. And in the Trader Kingdom archives, I do talk about trend days and uh, those sort of components. So you can go back in the archives in Trader Kingdom and see discussions I had on 
retracement trades. But today we're focusing on breaking new ground with reversals. So Gary will be happy. <laughs> For trend day, we have three things. We'll go into this conversation right now. But if you're doing intraday trading of futures, ETFs, individual stocks too, there's three things. And again, for my method, I keep it simple. There's no point in being complex. There's three things. Range day, which is highs and lows. Short the high, buy the low. It's called fade trading. This is by far the most common style of day structure, market profile, those sort of things. Trend day is your next common, maybe five to six to seven of these per month, depending on the volatility of the market. You had a lot more of these recently with the volatility, but before that, we had months and months of range days. So trend days is our second most common. That's when you have an opening gap. The market just goes up, 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 up. Uh, momentum strong, tick is strong, internals are strong, all those sort of components. And you basically buy the retracements. If it's going down, you short the retracements too, little flags. We'll talk about this, which is, I guess, the first time I've really done this presentation, uh, this, this focus on this aspect of the trend reversals. That's when you have an opening gap. That's when you have a market moving up, first hour, morning, but something goes wrong. Tick might not be as strong. A momentum is definitely not as strong. Volume isn't confirming. And the market stalls, kind of forms this little range, and trades down the remainder of the session. So we'll focus on those in terms of divergences. But we're not talking range days. We're going to skip over that for today's presentation and focus on the trend and range trend days and rounded reversals. So day structure, same thing, just kind of underscores what we do. And in my method, this is really all it is. It's two-factor. And the membership and the uh, clients I work with for uh, coaching, we're looking at bigger picture concepts, which is a higher time frame narrative, what the levels are. And I started posting that, I guess, a couple months ago on Fibonacci levels. So if you are new to the blog, blog.afraidtotrade.com, we take a look at this bigger picture Fibonacci, and that's our levels to trade toward, away from. That sets up our day. So what's the initial play? That's the higher frame. Second is this. It's going to be the day structure. So if price is interacting with a higher time frame level, which happened today, and maybe it starts to pull down away from it, that's going to be a possible reversal day. So like today's session, for example. And other ones we'll look at too. But the purpose we do this determines which indicators to use or ignore. And beyond that, which are the trades to take and which to avoid. So if you read the trading course book, this is chapter three, which is range alternation. So if the market's in a range or a flat environment, we're going to look for basically fade trades, right? And we're looking at the Bollinger Bands and divergences. On a trend day, if we're swing trading, a trending environment, big volatile market moving up, we're not going to look at divergences. We're not going to look at Bollinger Bands. That will hurt you. We're going to look at moving averages. So just the point is, whatever the market's doing, you would bring a set of tools and trades to the market. Let the market tell you. Let the market guide you. Don't try to use whatever tool you like. If you like reversals, don't do that in a big trending, strong volume, strong moving market. You're not going to succeed with that. Also, don't trade um, retracements because there is not a trend in a range or flat environment. They just don't exist. Look for fades. So this is, I think, working with clients over the last about eight or nine years now, this is kind of the biggest thing we work for, and you see failure. Uh, a, a trader comes in, they've learned a certain method, they use a certain indicator, and they try to use that in all market environments. That's great when the market conforms to their environment, if they're trade, uh, trade faders or trend faders or breakouts, if they're breaking out of a range, that's great. But the market doesn't always do that. So if you take away nothing from the presentation, just go in and focus on don't use the same tool, trade, all those sort of things in all environments. That's, I guess, the biggest advice I can give you. Let the market tell you and then employ specific tools to that environment. So Martin Pring, if you do take the CMT, those of you who have or want to learn more about technical analysis, the first book they give you is Martin Pring's uh, Technical Analysis which is basically the forecasting of that book, or TA explained, uh, it's going to be the first sentence or the first paragraph of that first book or the first course of the CMT stuff is this. TA, technical analysis, is the art, not science, of identifying a trend reversal at the earliest stage and then trading in the direction of that trend until the weight of the evidence. 
We'll use this as a model in the future. That proves the trend has reversed. In other words, if you see a trend, keep going with it. Keep trading in that direction with breakouts. And my favorite, hopefully some of your favorites, retracements. Do not try to employ reversal strategies unless the weight of the evidence proves it. That's not a reversal candle. That's not a singular divergence. That's not any one component. It's the weight of the evidence. It's a model. We're going to talk about some of that in today's session. So just jumping quickly, a trend by definition, again, TA101 here, you're going to have to have an uptrend. It's higher highs, higher lows. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. To reverse a trend, you're going to have to have lower highs and lower lows. We can quantify this and build up a trade setup. We'll talk about that with this reversal. So high high coming off the downtrend, low, 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 low high. Higher high, higher low, take it out. That's going to reverse a trend. It's not here. A trend doesn't reverse at the bottom or the top, strangely enough. It's going to reverse after the market does something which is break the progression. Higher high, higher low, take it out. And to reverse an up to down, we're going to have to have a lower high, lower low, lower high, take it out. And this is going to be, I think if you follow this procedure, it's going to help you a lot in your tradings. Do not take trend reversal trades unless this model has triggered or fired or occurred, which is a downtrend is broken with high, high, low, low, take it out. An uptrend's broken with low, 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 high. Take it out. You can go ahead and add this next component, which is one of my favorites, moving averages. For my models, we're looking at, and I've used this in 2003, really, 20-period exponential, 50-period exponential. You'll see these as green and blue on all the charts that I look at. And if you're going to be daily charts, which we're going to skip this now because we're not talking about daily charts, is the 200 simple. Call this the MAL, moving average orientation. 20 under 50, that's bearish, which is right here. 20 above 50, that's bullish. We're also going to model out the separation, how, dis how disparate or how distant those are. Flat, no separation and no trend. Big separation, big downtrend. So we'll use that to build up our blocks. This is the same chart, moving averages. Look at the crossover. Now, I have researched when I first started, I thought moving average crossovers are the best thing in the world. You find a crossover and trade it, and you're happy and good to go. Uh, that obviously doesn't work <laughs> because the market doesn't always trend. So this is a pure picture of perfection where a crossover is a bullish maneuver, a crossover is bearish, and so on and so forth. But the market doesn't always do this. More than not, a market will range or consolidate or flatten, go into a sideways trend. That's when you're going to see the market chop up and down to the moving averages, and those averages themselves will chop back and forth. So that doesn't really help us. So when you model this and test this out, it, you may have some positive resorts or positive resort results, but in the real world, this is just one piece. It's not the end all to do all to be all. So that's why we're going to use other factors to determine our plan. But nevertheless, crossovers are effective in trending environments. So here's a couple of examples just recently, back to September, a few weeks ago. This is the ES, S&P futures. And I'm just kind of cheating here, color coding it in, but you can do this on your own software. Just hand draw this, or just visualize or think about it. A negative crossover, 2050, we're going to color that red. We'll look to be able to short sell those retracements. That's a good little short sell there, down. But then the market jumps above it. They cross the September 15th here, and we're going to be looking to buy the market. Breakouts or retracements, little flags. ABC down, and up we go. When the market gaps down, pushes beneath it, September 16, there's your negative crossover. Short sell, short sell, whoops, back above. Anyways, it, it, you kind of get the message here. So if you look for this, if you trade breakouts or reversals, let's trade the breakouts of the moving average and crossover. Otherwise, I think, and I would recommend, trade retracements. But we're focusing on reversals, so this is the component. Moving average crossovers, higher low, higher high, take it out, and reverse. So the number one rule, as we jump along here, a trend is not reversed. Write this down. No, hint, hint, hint. Until 
the 2050 EMA's cross, it's the EMA cross, and price rises above a new higher high. Not the first higher high, but the second higher high. In this example, it is first higher high, first higher low, take it out. Call this the sweet spot or the TCZ, trend confirmation zone. It's a birth of a new trend. It's a Martin Pring model. You want to figure out what the trending environment is. If there is a trend, follow that trend until the weight of the evidence says or proves the trend has reversed. In this case, high, high, low, low, take it out, EMA cross, good to go. This again is a, I won't really focus too much on this, but it is a uh, trend reversal trade. This is an inherent trade. This is more so for swing traders, so don't get too caught up in the intraday. But just for reference, if you do want to engage the market on a trend day, this is how you would do it. And Scott's asking, how much room do you give the intraday market not to get stopped out in a five minute chart? I'll hold that question for a little bit because some of the other charts will go into more detail. But um, this is just a, a conceptual. So right now we're talking concepts. I will talk setups a little bit later. So I'll, I'll hold that thought. Thanks, Scott. Um, and so we're looking at this breakout. This is an inherent trade. Not the best because this is a later moment. You can be more sophisticated with this, with volume and internals and other factors we'll go into in a moment. But if you just want to be a part-time trader and don't want to do the deep, deep, deep level research analysis, which is fine. Uh, trading success, it's just like playing the piano. You don't have to be a concert piano player to be successful. You can just do it for fun. You can do it out of your own private residence and play the piano and have fun. Take a teacher, do some courses on YouTube or whatever, read some books, and you're good to go. You're going to play the piano, but you won't play in Carnegie Hall. So trading is really not that different than even playing golf or tennis or saxophone or whatever you want to guitar, whatever. It's whatever level you want to engage the market. That's fine. If you don't want to be a millionaire hedge fund trader, this might be a good strategy, which is just focus on this little method, high, high, low, low, cross, buy the breakout, and hold until it reverses, until it goes and does the other side. And Leon says, what are the averages? Those are going to be the 2050. Uh, on all charts that I use, just, I, when I first started learning TA, I just gravitated toward this, and it's worked out better than most. It's 2050. Exponential. And if you are swing trading, pop on that 200 symbol. So this is focusing on the separation, separation anxiety, aha, anyway, just separation of the moving averages. So this is the crash. If you went back in 2009, or 2009 September 9th, uh, this was our breakout from a wedge. This is a superb trend day, and this is really an, a, a textbook example. It doesn't happen that often. This is, by the way, the ES, again, five-minute chart early September. The so market gaps down. This is a trend day, quintessential definition, trend day, low, low, high, high, etc. And separation of these averages. You want to engage the market short, 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 short. Uh, do not buy retracements. Do not try to peg the reversal. That's a fool's game. Seems like it's, it's seductive, but it's like the sirens there in, in the Odyssey. It's just don't do that. So let the market prove itself. So the next session, the 12th, have that week in there, get the breakout, Cross, high, high, low, low, breakout. And the next day is just a down day. So this is, again, a model. So you're going to be buying, as the market's in a green phase, you're going to be buying retracements. When it goes into a red phase, you're short selling retracements. But again, that's for another presentation. So now let's go ahead and go. Any questions so far as we kind of we'll jump into the, take this EMA, take the price structure concept, make sure we have that down before adding more stuff to it. I'm going to give you a little moment to check in. There's no questions? Okay, cool. Jumping in, too. Just feel free to jump in with questions throughout the presentation, too. Uh, awesome. <laughs> Lauren says, no questions. It's helping. Good, good. That's what I want to hear. Um, all right, so if we go beyond the price and EMA, again, just to recap, price is high, high, low, low. Uh, take out a higher high, higher low. Take it out. Boom. That's your price-based reversal. And go one step further, we're looking at the EMA crossover. Shouldn't be too complicated, but if you're new, these are completely new concepts. So that's, that's perfectly fine. I'm 15 years into this, so I understand that I was once not a pro at this. Um, so we're going to add one more factor. It's going to be volume and momentum. So the volume is, I think, relatively self-evident. Uh, it's Dow theory. 
So as a trend goes higher, price goes up, high, high, low, low, etc., you want to see volume confirm that. You want to see volume picking up. In other words, if a trend's going up and volume's high, that indicates that participation is high, that fund managers, hedge funds, uh, big algo people, etc., fundamental people for that matter, Netflix, Google, Yahoo, LinkedIn, all those kind of things, they're confirming it, they're buying it. And that signals a likely continuity, a trend that's being bought up with vo high volume, high momentum, high internals, has much greater odds of continuing itself by the retracements than of reversing. So, but at the later stages, you will see divergences, lack of participation, lack of interest, lack of buying. Even though price keeps going up, you're going to see the other indicators pull off, back down, form divergences. Uh, and so this is an example of a positive divergence at the end of a downtrend. This is, you can't really see it, but it's an example of a negative divergence at the end, again, visualize with me, of an uptrend. So number two, well actually 2A, 2B, when volume and momentum, we'll talk about this later, but volume is just the uh, volume. It's just, you can use rate of change, you can use other things for momentum, but volume is just the flat out raw volume. Um, you can use on balance volume, but why, why make it complex? You look at volume itself. And momentum rise, so we're seeing this is boom, 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 boom. You're seeing new price highs confirmed, which is what the C stands for, for the momentum highs. That signals odds favor continuity. Confirmation continuity. That's great. Don't trade reversals. Don't do that. But when can you trade reversals? When the market forms divergences. Divergences, non-confirmation, leads to a reversal. So even then, you probably want it to break down and do something else. I don't like to go against the trend, even at the latter stages. Let the market push off, push down, make a lower low, make a lower high, and break a trend. Let it do something else. Don't just say, it's divergent, so I'm going to get short. Um, that's not usually an appropriate way to trade. You want to let the market do something. Again, it's Martin Pring. Look for the weight of the evidence. And we'll talk about this, rate of change, tick, breadth, 310. Uh, what else? Momentum oscillator, even stochastic RS. I mean, you know, a lot of things you can use. Just looking for non-confirmation. Now, this is kind of a cool concept. This is momentum has a leading edge. So again, that confirmation right here, boom, 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 boom. High, 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 high. Forecast a trend continuity. But if there are divergences, forecast the opposite. Let's focus on another factor that people overlook, that a surge of momentum, a burst, call this a kickoff, Wyckoff called it a sign of strength or a sign of weakness, is going to be a factor in our model that people look out, they, they, they overlook, they don't see it. They're not trained to see it, so I'm here to help you see it. So it is a big, big, big burst during an uptrend, just a continuity, great. But that similar surge after a divergence, after a downtrend, signals that preying style of new trend birth. So it's principle. Now, kind of, it's just better when I do this visually from an audience. But the harder you throw an object into the air, just kind of visualize a baseball, let's say, the higher it will travel, or the harder or faster it goes. That's acceleration. It's going up. It accelerates at a fast pace once it leaves your hand. But as it gets to the top of its arc, it's still going up but the acceleration is declining. We're gonna see this on the charts as divergences. So impulse, and we'll talk about it in a second. So back to this concept, new trends often have two factors, divergences, or the end of an old trend has divergences, the birth of a new trend similarly has proceeds by divergences, and then it's got this kickoff, which is right here. Corey's kickoff, Wyckoff's sign of strength, uh, etc. It's a new oscillator indicator volume internal high relative to the prior highs when price is not making a new high. It's hidden. If you don't know what to look for, you're not going to see this. This has helped me a lot in my trading. In terms of forecasting and the membership, I've called market reversals more accurately in sense or, in, in, in sense, or essentially because of this concept. So please, please, please make sure you understand this. It's kind of a big deal. 
So it's the same thing. Momentum spikes to a noticeable new high. Price is not at a new high. That's not. That's not necessarily a new high. Oscillator at an all-time chart high. Price just coming off the low. Not that thrilling. It's early reversal. And if you see a divergence, even better. And again, just if you want to back and research this, it is Richard Wyckoff was the one that kind of conceptualized this, but not on the intraday chart. He looked at daily charts, and this is a kind of a new today's world, 2016 and beyond. So which ones do you use? I like rate of change. I like 310. 310 is kind of an inspiration from Linda Rashke. 310 oscillator, I use that. Just flat out momentum. Lots of ways to do it. With, if you are focusing on intraday futures, go ahead and add breadth and tick. And maybe even volume and open interest. Breadth and tick, just for reference. Advancers minus decliners. Tick is the stocks are ticking up, make head an uptick, minus those ticking down, had a downtick. Just as a exchange generated information. It's more rapid, more up to date than breadth and volume. Just what's going on. So market rises on declining internals through negative divergence. Market falls on strengthening internals. That's buyers. This is hidden. The purpose is to figure out these things before your competition, before your other traders. And Scott asked, what about the trend? TRIN, traders index. That's going to be, I don't use the trend as much. It's kind of an inverse. Trend is inverse, which has to do with volume. So a, a rising trend's bearish, a declining trend's bullish, etc. cetera. Um, I think this is enough. If you want to use trend, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Um, it's just something I've never found that much successful in my own personal trading, so I, I don't use it. If you do, that's fine. I found really, breadth is kind of a larger picture concept in terms of how I forecast the next day for the members and, and for my own trading. So looking at breadth is kind of a bigger picture concept. Tick is intraday. That's great for five minute charting, one minute charting. I don't really use breadth for that level of analysis, but if I'm planning out the game plan for tomorrow, yeah, breadth is, is really important. So is volume. I'm going to focus my attention on tick a lot more if you're using five-minute charts. Um, just, it's kind of a helpful little indicator. So the kickoff, we conceptualize it. Visualize with me, if you will. Any symbol, any time frame, anything. And you can use this as any indicator. So it's kind of just making it clearer. So this is lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high. This is confirmation. Every time the price makes a lower low, the indicator also makes a lower low until we get to, this is a, say a daily chart in 2016 in January here. Whoops, Mar market makes a new low, indicator makes a higher low. All right, special, let's, let's pay attention to that. Possible trend reversal. Then the market goes on to break a trend line, possible reversal. But look at this, you can kind of squint and see it. Volume is at a highest level on the chart. So the momentum indicator volume is at the highest level when price is coming off of a downtrend. We're going to have a forecast vehicle. So here's a little clarification on it. Low, 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 low. Whoops. There's your kickoff. It forecasts this. Part of trading and again working with clients, this is probably the most difficult thing to conceptualize, the difficult thing to, uh, to communicate, is that you're making a forecast. When you put on it, well, first off, you have to have a bigger picture concept. What's happening? Who's in charge? Bulls, bears, buyers, sellers. But then once something happens in the market, you need a forecast. And that's just basically what's probably going to happen, which is, is the market, in this case, low, low, lower uh, confirmation. The forecast is for even lower prices. A divergence and a kickoff forecast a future reversal. That's what we're interested in talking about today. That's our key focal point, and that's what we're working on. So our forecast, if you see this in real time, is market goes up a little bit, goes down, goes up. So you're going to trade as the market does this. So I want to make sure we get that concept clear. A forecast is a probable future. I call this price pathways. For members, I draw these out many times. So I'll actually color code these or sometimes even draw them out for you and say, this, given the factors right now, the next couple of sessions are going to be bullish or bearish or push between this Fibonacci level to that, or push between this average to that, and your trades, therefore, will be intraday retracements or 
breakouts, etc. as the market either follows the forecast, which that's great, isn't it? Or doesn't. You often get bigger moves if the market surprises the majority. That's when we get short squeezes and call them long liquidations, big moves. So this is an example from earlier in August, just going back to the Russell futures here. Those who trade Russells, um, this is the 23rd of August. So kind of forget this as it goes up, but let's focus on this right here. Higher high, higher low, positive average. You want to buy this pullback, that's great, all is well, wonderful. Whoops, look at this. This is our 310 oscillator. Um, this is the highest, essentially the highest high, exclude that spike, highest high of the day. Bump it up. And this is the lowest momentum reading relative to it. And the 310, yeah, PWC, do you use the MACD 310? Yeah, definitely. Now this is, it's a, it's a custom indicator, but it's just basically the, the MACD, you can customize, it's, it's 12.26.9, I think. Just make it 310. I take off the signal. I don't want to see the signal. I don't necessarily care about that little red line that goes up and down, back and forth. I just want to know, in terms of the MACD, uh, is it confirming or disconfirming? A higher price high on a higher momentum high uh, should forecast a higher high yet to come. Great. Continuity. by the pullback. But a lower momentum high with a higher price high forecast a possible reversal. I want to know that. So you can use rate of change, not that much different. Indicator for trade station and I think Ninja also, most, most platforms have it, momentum. Which is what's the price uh, back here, say 14 bars ago, and what's the price now? And that difference is going to be what the indicator tells you, it's just a rolling average. That's all you're doing. Volume is the same. Highs, confirmation, divergence, confirmation. And internals, breadth and uh, tick, same thing. So I want to know uh, the Russell's up here at 1246. Got some divergences. So the forecast for the next day is not good. Well, not bear, not bullish. As a session opens, we're going to gap down before it opens. Gap down. And again, I'm here in Los Angeles, so this is uh, Pacific time if you're curious. Um, momentum makes a new low. Now keep in mind, this is... Uh, prices at 1242. The last time this momentum oscillator was negative two was back here when price was 1227. That's kind of a big difference. This is a hidden signal. If you don't know what to look for, you're not going to see it. You're going to miss out on a lot of information. So, yeah, Leon says, why don't I use vol sometimes uh, in terms of vol? Why don't I use dollar sign V O L D volume differential for volume? I I have and in charts of indicators for members on the weekly members. Sometimes I do. The volume differential is just, it's not just the uh, breadth, it's the advanced versus decliners. Vol takes it one step further, kind of jumps up a little bit in the analysis, is volume flowing into advancing stocks minus volume flowing into declining stocks. I, there's value in that, certainly, but I, again, simplicity. Um, I've had to learn the CMT material, Elliott Way, Fibonacci, a point and figure, I mean, you name it. And I just, my trading suffered, honestly, when I started using all these things at once. It was kind of like information overload, and my performance declined. So I'm like, okay, let's go back to the basics and sort of building up from there. So again, I'm not going to poo-poo anything or talk negative about any indicator. If you find it successful, fine. We're all going to be different, and I just like breadth. Um, Vold is certainly a good component. It's, it's, it takes it a step further. But in this one, it's, it's just talking momentum. So same same concept, same same. Uh, by the way, in, in terms of 2009, go back and research this. In the I think it was March, or the March low from March, April, June, you had a surge. Oh my gosh, it was brilliant! A surge of volt, surge of momentum, surge of uh, breadth and volume coming off the 2009 low. You don't know that's the low in terms of the all-time you know bear market low at that point. But again, go back in your own time, look at volt on say a daily or hourly chart or something, and you'll see some pretty interesting uh, information there. It's, it's just one of the biggest kickoffs um, in terms of a bullish, you're at the lows. I mean, you're in the middle of a bear market, recession, depression, all this kind of horrible stuff's going on, yet the market doesn't say that. It, it's, it's got a kickoff, a big divergence, big kickoff, and uh, I went on a podcast, essentially, I think it was April or, or May or so with a fundamental analyst, and he was asking, oh, how low is the market going to go, Corey? What's it going to be? 
And he's like, well, that jobless rate is this, and a new administration that. He's threw all these fundamental reasons at me. And my response is, we've hit the low, we're going higher. Oh my gosh, you ought to have heard him on the interview. Well, well, anyway, so, <laughs> all right, anecdotes aside, but, <laughs> and of course, the market did bottom. But that was part of it. I made that forecast in part because of this concept. And Volt was certainly a part of it. Again, just for reference, Volt is volume differential. Um, moving forward, this is August 29, 30, and 31st. Focus wheel left to right in terms of a discussion. Uh, again, Russell. Big kickoff. Kind of just draw your attention here. Low, 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 high, low, low, uh-oh. Positive divergence. Big momentum burst. Big indicator jump up here. That forecast a possible reversal, which ultimately is what happened. So buy the pullback, buy the pullback. You get about two trades in this structure, right? The pullback, by the way, again, other presentation, um, it's just a retrace the rising averages, put your trade in as close as possible, put your stop under the blue one, and uh, you can also buy on a break of a trend line. Hold it for as long as possible until price breaks under a trend line, hits the upper Bollinger, something like that. Uh, anyway, so as it pushes on up here at 11 o'clock Pacific, Look at that. This is the highest high on the chart. Ooh, exciting. 12.43. And this is the lowest momentum high. If you don't see this, you're probably really, really bullish because it's a higher high, higher low, uptrend, etc. This is going to give you pause. Got two divergences. One, two. <clears throat> Next move is a kickoff. Now, this is fun. This is real world stuff here. I wanted to show you this for educational purposes, which is the market doesn't always just hit a divergence, hit a kickoff, and fall off the cliff. There's a lot of tricks, traps, and this is the real world, so I'm not you know, trying to sugarcoat this. Trading's difficult. It takes a lot of research and information to do it and uh, fortitude and a lot of kind of mental preparation because this is your concept. The market's going to reverse. It's going to fall on, fall down, kickoffs, divergences. Maybe that's a higher frame resistance level, but darn it, if it stabs up one more time, kickoff, uh, back down, kickoff, back up, and finally, kickoff. So even if you got short somewhere in this area, your concept was correct using this forecast, and I'd forecast this too, that we're, we're bearish, going to go into the next session bearish, and factors are staying for a, a type of reversal, but darn it if the market didn't do a range day. Ugh, no fun. But eventually the analysis was correct. So always when you're doing this, trust yourself, trust the analysis. If you have experience, uh, track records, all that kind of stuff, Trust yourself. And again, working with clients, same thing. It's just you know the rules, but work with the market. Go with the, and it, this is, for me, I still do this, and it still tricks and traps me up. Gary asks, how can you avoid whipsaws? Ha! Ha! I wish you could, I uh, wish it was an answer. I mean, again, 15 years of doing this, and I've had my mentors, I have people work with me um, in the industry. I have colleagues and clients I, I talk with uh, regularly, and I have not found a sufficient answer. The, the best one for me is market, it's a concept of market profile. Is there isn't some mean old person or mean old hedge fund on the other side, it's not Goldman Sachs, you know, it's sitting here trying to bump you out of your position and take your money and laugh all the way to the bank. That's, that's not actually what's happening. The market is a um, buy and sell, supply, demand, it's, it's, it's an auction. Really, if you're, if you're concerned with traps and stuff and how to avoid them, see them, and, and et cetera, uh, read read uh, Stottlemyre's work. Read uh, Jim Dalton, Market Profile. He never really talks about it, but the concept is is this. It's a market that's going to probe up. So think of like an auction. An auction is going to continue. Uh, the price could go really high. It could, could, be, could be really efficient. It could be really you know, ex extended from fair evaluation. But as long as two, three, four people in the audience keep bidding, they're doing inefficient behaviors. But as long as they keep bidding... The auctioneer is going to have to keep raising the price until they all, until all but one sits down, and that's when the market's going to. Well, that's when the auction's going to end. So this whipsaw stuff, it's not nefarious or whatever. It's just a probe. The market's saying a question. It's asking you a question. Hey, I'm at a new high. Do you want to buy me in terms of putting on new trades, or if you're a short seller, is this enough for you to panic out and take your stop and? and call it a, a day or something, or do you want to hold your conviction, hold your short, and keep going, or as a buyer, are you distrusting this move? This whipsaw stuff is nothing more than a probe. It's just saying the same thing. Hey, I'm back at the high. 
do you want to buy me? And if the answer is no, the market goes down, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this little trick and trap and icky little stuff right here is, is just that. It's, and I'm going down, here I go, but oh, are, do you really want me to go down? I, I, I can go up. And of course, sellers say, no, I want you to go down. And just conceptualize it like that, uh, kind of an off-topic discussion, but um, that's just it. it. This trick stuff, how do you avoid that? Um, trust your methods, trust the indicators, trust supply-demand, this little arc pattern. And patterns are a good thing to go to. Bolkowski and uh, Edwards and McGee and Shavik are all these scholars that have talked about patterns. Uh, even John Murphy, Martin Pring, for that matter. These patterns have a, they tell a story of supply-demand. So anyway, uh, trust the methods, widen your stops maybe, and you get, should I wait, for, should we just wait for the rollover? Um, if, let's just talk, you know, not talk turkey here, but if, if you think the market, let's just say it's 8 o'clock, it, it's early, uh, mid-session here on the 30th. If you're convinced that the market's going to roll over, using even this method or there's a Fibonacci level at 1243 or et cetera, and you start to engage the market short for a reversal trade to carry the next session or just beyond, right in midday, so 1240, you, you engage short somewhere in here. Um, your stop should be above the prior high because that uh, your, your thesis is correct as long as the market does not make a higher high. So this is one of those little, I call it a finger, um, spike or market profile calls it excess. It's a failed test, but it's goodness gracious, that's going to give you a headache and sweaty palms and all that kind of stuff when you're when you're short. When you're short and correct, I put it that way. When you're short and correct, you probably want to put your stop above that. Should you wait for the rollover? Um, it, it, ten ten ways to next Tuesday. Uh, the market. I can show you dozens of examples where it's going to stab and, and do this, and then go over. I can show you just as many examples where the market hits this and just rolls over straight on. It doesn't do this trick and trap stuff. Um, figure out in your own testing and your own trading and just go with what makes sense to you. If you're confident and trust your methods, hold short, put a stop, walk away, and, and take a walk or something and let the market do its thing. Um, you may have to trade smaller size with wider stops, but that's an adjustment you have to make. Versus if you wait for a confirmed breakdown, which... I like, I'm more conservative in my trading. I like the market to do something, not just theoretically, you know, I want it to break a trend line, break a level, break a moving average. I would probably short in this, if I were to engage it, I wouldn't shorten this mess. I'd short on the break at 2039. I recognize this as a support level, that's a range, and I want to see it test off and come down, which it did, and I want to see it break. So I want the market to prove itself, break down and generate action. And if so, my stop's going to be above that. You eventually got what you wanted, which was the market falling over. Um, kind of tricked you, though. So I, that's a real-world example, obviously. Moving on. This is uh, NASDAQ. It's going to be the uh, NQs here in September, a couple of weeks ago. Actually, last week. So here's the same thing. Market, forget the push up. We're focusing on this, on this. New momentum high, 11 Pacific, forecast higher highs yet to come. All right, that's what happened. So this little forecast, if you were to freeze a chart, if I could do that with you, and look at this tick high, momentum high, tick high, you would forecast at in real time. Price is probably going to go higher. Therefore, I'm going to buy the pullbacks. That was correct. Wonderful. But then as price does go to the new highs, if you're reading the reports when I do the reports on the next session and planning out the next day, it's a fact that price is at new highs on this intraday chart. It's also a fact that you're diverging. Boom, 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 negative, negative. Uh, it's just it's peeling off. So your price is up, your internals, your gut to the market, your stock's moving up and down, and your momentum are moving lower. That's a, back to Dow theory, non-confirmation, and odds favor a reversal. Can you play it short? Oh, yeah. Just walk up and short that, hold it overnight. Do I do that? Uh-uh. No, no, no. I want to, I, I typically, with, with, um, when I'm swing trading, I swing trade either ETFs or leading stocks. I do not swing trade intraday futures. Not something I personally do. Uh, but I will develop a game plan. So I believe the market tomorrow, and I'll put this out for members, of course, that the market will trade lower. Here's my rationale. Da, 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 da. 
And so if the market actually does trade lower tomorrow, you want to short sell the pullbacks, etc. And usually I'll give levels. Seven, four, seven hundred, it's a great little spot to target. Market's gonna play down away from 750, 760. Where's your target? Uh, four, seven, that's 50 points down. Great, that, that's abnormal, but that's what you're trying to do. So what do you do in that scenario? Play it short, short that, short that, there it is. So, and there's your kickoff, by the way. Other factor, if you are doing this professionally and full-time, reversals do well at higher time frame levels. So if you start to see this pattern, I didn't really pull it out for this presentation, but y'all are great to our audience. So I definitely want to uh, underscore this point. This is a higher time frame support level, 4.7. That's a factor. People will trade reversals just because of that. You'll have money flow out of the short sells, because that's a target, right? 50 points down, that's pretty fun. Um, and pretty nice, pretty nice to do. But then buyers will buy for no other reason than it's at a support level. So when you see this pattern, positive divergences and a kickoff on an intraday chart at a higher time frame support level, oh my gosh, you know that's that's phenomenally exciting. That's where I get really excited and uh, will trade a little bit larger size and be more aggressive. And of course it worked. So that's what I'm talking about. You can wait for the higher high, higher low, take it out, etc. Fine, that's playing the piano out of your you know home. Or you can do this little in-depth stuff with your higher time frame support level, intraday positive divergence, uh, kickoff after that after the divergence. Oh my gosh! I mean, you've got multiple factors that says market's probably going to go higher. Or to be professional, buyers are going to overtake sellers, which is what happened. So we want to make sure we're good on that because that's I mean, if I could sort of you know da -da -da -da, pay attention here, this would be that point. So questions on on the we're almost finished here, but questions on this concept? Or anything mentioned so far? If not, jumping in. Yeah, this, you've been a good audience. So let's go ahead and do the final. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Good job. All right. A couple more, and then we'll wrap up. We're looking at kickoffs and divergences before the crash. And I did this. I don't do this. I'm a conservative trader, and I'm even more conservative as an analyst. So I'm not this flashy, you know, market calls and that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of, oh my God, the market's going to crash. I think that's ridiculous, but there were so many factors, so many factors that said the market was going to go into a, uh, a sell swing. And it's on the blog. You can go back and look at it, but it's uh, before the crash. It's essentially a bearish rising wedge, multiple factors. Let's step inside and look at one of those factors. And by the way, Lauren says, how do you get your MACD SMA to look like that? And uh, Ninja Trader, I can't uh, assume to get it right. This, it's a custom indicator. And so what it is, it's just basically, and I, I there's actually two. So the kind of the kind of secret is, this is two indicators in one. Indicator one is your standard MACD. It's your differential in the three and ten, which is going to give you the um, the line. But I, I repeat the code. This is trade station, so I repeat the code, and I do it again. So I'm seeing the exact same thing with a histogram. So it's actually two and one. One of which is a, uh, I guess a line chart. The other overlaid on it is a histogram. It's my little <laughs> secret there. And sometimes if, if I'm feeling sort of frisky, I'll put colors on there for like presentations. It'll be red above and green beneath, or, you know, ah, uh, red beneath and green above. But mainly it's it's two. So I'm, I'm duplicating the code, essentially. Uh, but it doesn't matter. This, it's just visual. It's what I like. It doesn't have to be like this. All you, you, you The histogram doesn't matter. It's just what's your line, particularly like this. Um. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Well, email. Uh, feel free to email me. If you want to compare, I can send code or try to work with you, Lauren. It's Corey at AfraidTheTrade.com. I'd be happy to sort of help you with the code if, if I can, or just actually, and that same goes for everybody too. Um. Anyway, so pushing up to four eight three five. Uh, you've got your div. This is a multi swing div, by the way. Multi day div. Call this an external div because it's multiple swings. This is an internal div because it's just boom to boom, high to high to high, da da da. So you got a multi-factor divergence um, in momentum and tech. That's phenomenal. Walk up and short that, or be a little more conservative. Let the market do something, which is break the average, break a swing low, and you also had to kick off. So as the market, we reiterate this: when the market's at about 423, 425. You're popping off a new kick, a new tick low, new kickoff. 
that's under 600. Market hasn't done that since it was back uh, 4795. It's a kickoff. That forecast a lower low yet to come, which eventually it did. But so as we go forward with that, short sell this, short sell that. And the next, I think it was the ninth, when the market just sort of, and you saw in the chart, just hideously uh, crashed. But that's, if you really get deep inside the chart, and obviously this is not enough to, set, to forecast a crash. We had multiple indicators, including a really, really clear bearish rising wedge. Internals were falling, and it just, like, it, it's uh, back on the blog. And of course, if you take the trial membership, you can go back and read what I was saying in real time. And just even as a model or as an educational, how does Corey do this or how do I do this? How do you forecast? I was pretty adamant the market was set up for a pretty steep dive and, and that's it exceeded the targets I had, which is kind of cool. But this was a factor in it. So the presentation here for reversals is specifically geared toward that. All right, so again, uh, divergences kick off. Be sure that you have a confirmation. Don't just be a gunslinger. Let it break through the stuff, moving averages, trend lines. And this is back to Preen. Love Martin Preen. Identify a reversal early. Uh, kind of, I'm paraphrasing, but, but then trade with the trend until the weight of the evidence proves reversal. Uh, high, high, low, low. Moving average break. Kickoff, volume spike. All those break a low, break a triangle, break a wedge, break a head and shoulders, whatever. Uh, let the market do that. And it's, you want to go in the direction of that reversal, not until. And if you want to go and trade this, which again is beyond the purview of this hour, but you do the first reaction and trade breakouts or tracements in the direction of the new trend. You can hold it. I just put your call it a core trade, not a core trade, but a core trade. When you think a trend has reversed, put a core trade on and hold it until you get a reversal signal the other way that may last a couple of days, a couple of sessions, a couple of days for swing trading, maybe last a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so. But anyway, it's all relative to your time frame. Same thing goes for oil, gold. You can't use internals on those, um, et cetera. You can't use volume in Forex. So you're kind of flying blind in that market, but you're still going to have uh, divergences. And these same concepts will play out uh, no matter what you're working on on that. So anyway, so if you do see higher frame stuff, which I just saw, I mentioned earlier, that's going to signal even bigger reversals. So that big old, um, what was it, the bearish, a rising wedge and the market volatility was picking, was compressing, and all the factors that you're, it's going to be in the membership there um, is uh, playing in. So big, big, big picture stuff leads to big moves, and you can trade those quite aggressively on your lower frame. Do I use the 2050 crossover? Gary says, uh, do I use the crossover 2050 for the exit? Yeah, absolutely. Let me jump back before I go into the uh, conclusion and talk about that real quick. So yeah, absolutely. When you're doing this little concept, if you are engaging the market like that, um, if you're just not a full-time trader, maybe you have a full-time or part-time job, retirement, whatever, you don't want to sit here and do this all day long. This, again, is the same thing with uh, swing trading and et cetera. So there's your cross. There's And you, you focus on a model. Have some rules. Write your rules out. But yeah, I don't see a problem with that. I don't necessarily do this as much as I used to or hardly at all because I'm sitting here all day doing this. But if you don't want to do that, don't have the time, this is a model that can help you. It's high, high, low, low, kick off, cross, hold it. Hold the thing all the way until the next session, in this case. Low, 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 high, break it out or take it out. And then same thing, down, down, down. Eventually this reverse back up. And same thing, up, down, short. This is the SPY back a, a few years ago. And so you're going to pop, let's see, 106.50 down to, well, that's about $1.50. It's not that bad. And 105 to 105, about a dollar, uh, and if you get down to here is about two dollars. So, um, not bad, just in terms of just using reversal strategies. Uh, what trades get stopped out? Um, yeah, John says, John says, just why, with all the knowledge um, and knowledge. It by the way, there's something else about trading. Uh, Mark Douglas does a really good example of this, which is um, uh, it, it's knowing what to do, doing it, and having the confidence to uh, jump in there. But in terms of with all the knowledge I have, what percent do I get stopped out? So the, each trade, jump back to that, has a, uh, a certain percent of success failure. Retracements, I typically get anywhere from 65 to 75. But again, what's, I'm conservative. I'm also very, uh, not Brad, I'm not Donald Trump. I'm, I'm intellectual at this. I think this out. I research this. So I am very selective in my setups. 
Um, so I typically get 65 to 75 on retracements. That doesn't mean I make a lot of money on that because retracements are, uh, they're very high percentage, but they're very low in terms of reward risk. You may, I may be playing for sometimes risking two S&P points to get three or risking two to get four or five or something like that. A breakout, you might risk three, four points and play for 10 or more. So in terms of, and I don't really do uh, breakouts, sorry, breakouts. I don't typically do reversals, uh, sorry, <laughs> breakouts. But if I did, um, you would be having, a, uh, with the clients I work with and things I've done myself and back testing modeling, you're probably going to have less than 50%. It just doesn't sound fun, doesn't sound sexy, but that is reality of the game. Um, there are more times the market will break and fail than it just breaks and goes. So you're going to have less than 50%, um, but you need to hold the position to get, say, four times, five times, six times your risk. And reversals, my goodness. I mean, if you're pretty good at this stuff um, and you have an affinity for it and it's working out, you can get multiples of your... You can actually be quite accurate. You can push it above 50% if you really let the model play itself out, let the market give signals. You can push above 50% with reversal trades and have... It's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, but you can also do little retracements on the way, and that's what I do. I personally, speaking of my own trading activity, uh, on the intraday, now swings a little bit different, but intraday stuff, um, I really have focused on trend days and trading retracements. That's pretty much what I do. So I fortunately have an account size that I don't really have to worry about day-to-day -day expenses. So I, I'm not really chugging along. If I needed a lot, a lot of money, I'm going to have to up the risk, risk quotient, but I don't. And so... I'm able to be more selective with my trades, um, do a little play, a little more games with size. So uh, on a big trend day, I'm going to size bigger than, say, a, you know, a less confident trend day. But I focus on this, and I would say, you just kind of go back to the original question, uh, 65, 75. Breakouts have always been less than 50, and reversals, I don't really do those. Um, besides, it, it, what I qualify as a reversal trade really just, to me, becomes a retracement. I'm not going to trade this little spot. I'm going to trade the retrace. So I don't. I don't really have. Uh, I, when I classify my trades in the month, I don't really do reversals, honestly. Yeah, John says I struggle with holding on to profits, and holding on to losses and praying. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't we all? Well, that's, again with clients and this again. 15 years of doing this, almost 16 in January now. Um, so that's the biggest thing. It's when you're doing these methods. You model and I with clients and and the. Uh, in the book, etc., you model these things out. If you play retracements, that is going to appeal to certain people, myself included, that are risk averse, that like security, that like winning, that don't necessarily have to have a lot of money, which I know sounds weird. You're doing this for money, but there's more to it. Um, if you want money, you're going to have to go for breakouts and reversals, and you're probably going to be stressed out. You're probably going to feel weird. You're probably going to be praying to you know, whatever they had to you in the market gods or whatever, you're going to have a harder time with it. Um, but you're probably going to make more money than someone like me. I've had clients that are very, very risk-seeking. They love trading breakouts, and I love those reversals. They've beat me on monthly profits. They've beat me sometimes on, on, on days. That's fine. Um, you set your parameters. You set your position size. You set your account size. And you set your activity level. I mean, you set all these little things like a chessboard. You did, it's Mark Douglas is trading in the zone. This is a game. Trading is a fun, I said it's a contact sport, but a fun mental sport. But you set the parameters. When you enter, when you exit, what your stop is, what your target is, what your market is, what your frame, blah, 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 blah. And uh, if, if you're uncomfortable, do something else, for heaven's sake. Uh, if you're trading Forex and you're really not sleeping at night, trade something else. Um, you know, If you're trading stocks, it's what happened to me. I was trading stocks and not making a whole buku of money. So I started trading uh, ETFs leveraged. That worked well, but as I got more professional, I went to the futures market. So now I'm kind of doing the same thing that I was doing, but I'm making a lot more money because the futures market is just so leveraged. So you know, don't feel like you have to do something because for whatever reason, just find what works. Scott says, uh, oh, well done, thank you, really good stuff. I live in Southern California, sweet. Uh, if you do a presentation in the area, look forward to it. And sign up. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Scott. Here about the PDF. Oh, sweet. Thank you, Scott. Any questions, let me know on that. So Scott's given a, a good a good feedback. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, welcome to Southern California. Yeah. And then Leon says, does price breakout come from the channel or triangle? Um, 
the price breakout cover channel triangle. Well, um, not quite sure what uh, price breakout come from channel or triangle. I guess on this little example, this is a kind of a theoretical example. Um, well, not really. I mean, it's real price action, but obviously you conceptualize. Um, a breakout, I don't think I've done a presentation specifically on breakouts. It was kind of fun for uh, to do this. I really enjoyed this, but breakouts is a whole separate thing. Um, breakout, it's, it's chapter three of the trading course book, if you're, if you're interested. It's um, concept of market alternation that a market in a range environment will eventually break out. It has to, which is market profile, market behavior, will break into a trend. A trending environment will break into a range. A range environment will break into a trend ad nauseum. Um, so volatility is actually a lot, if you do options especially, it's a lot easier to forecast than um, direction. So that's just kind of tuck that away. Um, but no, a, a breakout from a range is going to be a triangle, which is this one. It's compression, price overlap, and then breakout. Could be a range, could be a wedge. We just had that breakout from September 9th or whatever it was. The uh, the crash was this hideous, hideous, hideous uh, rising wedge. It was I think it was obvious. I don't think I was any, any special about that, but it, it was a very accurate call. I was very adamant about it, and, and it was kind of cool. But it was a wedge. So you're you're looking at a uh, to draw trend lines when the market ejects or moves away from the trend lines. That's your breakout trade. It's not a retracement, not a reversal. Um, how do you, as someone asked, uh, Leon says also, how do you avoid failed breakout? Um, huh, this is different than the market profile. So if uh, some of the best trades you get are unexpected moves, if you can sort of switch gears, if you really bias yourself and say, well, the market's got to go, let's say, down because Janet Yellen's going to raise rates and Donald Trump's going to be president and you just have all these seven, eight, nine focal points, or Obama's president, whatever, Hillary, whatever the, your the thesis is, you, you, you bias yourself to be bearish. And so the market breaks down. And by the way, if you think that, trust me, there's a lot of other people that think that too. So they, they engage the market the same way you do it. But you and the other participants, say this is going down and up, are going to place their orders on the break, but they'll place their stops above it. And so the market breaks down, woo woo, that's great. But then this comes up and puts the midpoint, comes up and breaks above that, that's knife through butter. That's, you know, goodness gracious, if you are biased and blind, which is inappropriate trading, not taking your stop, holding on and, and that kind of stuff, you're going to have significant losses. What's the flip side of that? The flip side is if somebody who did not engage the market short, maybe just walked up and didn't even think about it, like Apple or Qualcomm. I don't, I don't know anything about Qualcomm, just for example, but let's say it, it did this little pattern.